Hello and welcome. I'm Alex Matthew and this is the first episode of a new series on ET Now called Spotlight. Like the name suggests, we zero in on a topic, dive deep and get you the perspective that you need. Now there's no doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic has deeply affected the Indian economy, just like it has several economies across the world. The impact to India's economy in the financial year that ended on the 31st of March is now known. It is estimated that India's GDP contracted by 7.3% and most of that was an account of the first wave of the pandemic. The onset of the second wave of the pandemic, which led to localized restrictions in several geographies across the country, has pegged back the economic recovery that had started gathering pace. And in fact, this second wave of the pandemic is expected to have impacted a larger number of people, not just in terms of the numbers, but it's expected to have been more insidious in that it has affected the more vulnerable rural population as well. On this episode of ET Now Spotlight, we attempt to study the degree of impact on the rural economy, both in terms of whether the output has gotten affected, both manufacturing as well as agricultural, and also whether there has been demand destruction. Take a look. Rural India may have escaped the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's been hit hard by the second wave. To understand the impact to the rural economy, it is first imperative to understand its size and the number of people that depend on it. The problem is, a lack of data makes this very hard to do. A Niti Aayog discussion paper back in 2017 pegged the rural economy as contributing a little over 45% of national income. And as per the latest census which was conducted in 2011, 68.8% of India's population and 72.4% of its workforce resided in rural areas. Over half of that workforce, based on the census, was engaged in agricultural and allied sector activities. But contrary to popular perception, non-agricultural activities account for nearly two-thirds of rural gross value added. What's more, the Rabi and Kharif crops only account for about 60% of agricultural output. The rest is made up of activities like forestry, animal husbandry and horticulture. As a result, though major agricultural output has not been impacted, with Rabi crop arrivals at Mundi's at higher levels this year than last, there are signs that the rest of the rural economy has taken a blow. Yes, uh, rural India at this time is more uh, hit than it was last time. We will see how the recovery has to take place. We have to pray once again to the rain gods uh, to see that we have another normal monsoon because a lot of that economy is driven by agriculture. It will require government support as well, especially for people at the lower end of the pyramid, like done last year. Uh, whether through food as well as through some income support. So it's again a combination of these factors that we saw last year. You need that right combination again this time. The exact degree of impact to non-agricultural output is hard to quantify, but localized lockdowns are expected to have affected the services industry in rural areas. And small and medium enterprises engaged in manufacturing have likely faced a slowdown on account of linkages with industry in urban areas. The lack of employment prompted a surge in applications to the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. But this scheme too has borne the brunt of the pandemic. In April, out of the 2.73 crore households that applied for work under the scheme, 2.13 crore were allotted work. As many as 2.76 crore households then applied in May. And the allotment number fell to 1.66 crore, according to information released by the Ministry of Rural Development. Sowing in the Kharif season will begin after the onset of the monsoon. A clearer picture of the availability of labour will then be known. Economists fear that it isn't just the hit to household incomes that will have a bearing on rural demand. Medical costs or the anticipation of spending on healthcare will discourage spending at least in the short term. An India Ratings report estimates that over 60% of rural households with hospitalized cases borrow, sell assets including gold 
or rely on contributions from friends and relatives to pay for inpatient care. SBI research found that consumption of everything from diesel to two-wheelers, tractors, passenger vehicles and fertilizers fell in April on a sequential basis. And with the hit to demand evident, there are calls for the government to intervene. While some of the things like we did for the poor people like in rural India, direct transfer of benefit, free food grains, ramping up the Manrega investment, I think that has to be, the outlay perhaps might have to be increased and that has to continue. We also have to focus on the urban poor. We have to look at it from a lens of how do we give a security cover to MSMEs, the stress sectors. India's economy has proven its resilience in the past, but the COVID-19 pandemic is a challenge like no other. A great deal still remains unknown, and chief among these is whether India will face another wave of the pandemic. With restrictions being lifted in various states, a rebound in economic growth is being projected. But rural India may just take a little longer to clamber back to its feet. And that's something that the RBI Monetary Policy Committee took cognizance of in its latest review of monetary policy. RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das specifically mentioned the downside risks to growth in rural India when he announced that the growth forecast for India in FY22 was being revised downward. Listen in. Rural demand is expected to remain strong as forecast of a normal monsoon bodes well for sustaining its buoyancy going forward. The increased spread of COVID-19 infections in rural areas however, pose downside risks. Taking all these factors into consideration, real GDP growth is now projected at 9.5% in 2021-22, consisting of 18.5% in first quarter, 7.9% in second quarter. Now, a lot of what the pandemic has thrown up since its onset in early 2020 has been unexpected and unprecedented. There have been several learnings, both from the first and second wave and from the experiences of other countries, but there are still a lot of questions, a lot of what ifs. What if the impact to the economy is more significant than we earlier thought? What if the rural economy takes long to recover? What if the recovery is patchy? What if there is a third wave and how deep will the impact be then? I'm joined now by someone who has attempted to answer a few of these questions and more besides. Dr. Soumya Kanti Ghosh, who is the Group Chief Economic Advisor at State Bank of India. Thank you so much, Dr. Ghosh, for taking the time for speaking to us. And uh, always a pleasure having you on the show. In your most recent report, you've downgraded your outlook for India's economic growth to 7.9% from 10.4% earlier. How much of this is because of the signs that you have seen that the rural economy has been significantly impacted? You've clearly stated in the report that the impact to the economy is disproportionately larger this time around and that the rural economy is not as resilient as its urban counterpart. Have you managed to gauge the extent of that damage to the rural economy? Though? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me on the show. No, I think uh, uh, the downgrade of our estimates at 7.9% is actually quite a sharp one. Uh, but this has been the case throughout last year and this year also. Uh, but the moot point over here is that the impact on the rural economy this time has been unprecedented. If I just put in perspective some numbers, and I think these numbers are disconcerting, is that if you actually have the the, ex the way this impact of COVID is commonly measured, the most common index measure is that how much of the total proportion of cases, new cases which are coming up every day is from the rural areas. Now, this number actually had peaked at 53.7% last week. Uh, and then last to last week, and then it has started to decline. So it was at 51.6. Interestingly, in the first wave in the, in the month of August, or the, uh, August, if the number was also at 53.7. So we thought that this number may have reached the peak, then it started to rebound. But today we found out that this percentage have again started to go up and now the total percentage of new cases which are from rural areas are at 52%. 
So this is actually a point of worry. And our reports show that the take that the devastation and destruction in the rural areas in terms of the loss of human lives has been much more than the urban areas this time. And the fact that uh, the point which everybody is talking about that the impact of the second wave will be lower. Yes, the impact of second wave technically could be lower in terms, if you just talk in terms of the simple economics, because rural economy contributes a lower share to the overall India's GDP around 14% share. But the important point to note is that even though the share is on the lower side, even the fact that rural economy is not as resilient as urban economy and the per capita income in rural areas is much lower than the urban areas. So whatever loss would have happened in the rural areas, so that loss actually will take much longer time to recover. Or alternatively, what is going to happen is that we may have a lower loss this year compared to last year first quarter, but that loss actually will be difficult to uh, 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 it will be very difficult to make up for. So therefore, we have degraded our growth rate to 7.9%. Understood. One of the factors that is worrying a lot of poly policymakers, and in fact all of us as well, is the potential or even the probability of a third wave, Dr. Ghosh. You've studied uh, what has happened in several other countries across the globe in terms of the duration and the peak of the first, second and third wave. What does that tell you and what can we learn from that? Uh, what can we expect from that when you talk about India? See, I think this is again a very interesting point to note. Let me again give you some data over here. Uh, if you look into the countries all around, uh, India, if, I, if I'm not including India at this point of time, there has been multiple waves and third wave has happened in most of the countries. Now in most of the countries, the second wave peak was around 5.2 times higher than the first wave peak. And the peak which happened in the third wave was actually 1.8 times higher than the peak which happened in second wave. Now let me put these numbers in Indian perspective. In India in peak one, which happened I think on September 16, it was around 97,860. In India, in peak two, I think it happened on March 7th, if I'm correct, it was around 4 lakh 14,000 lot. So that makes it 4.2 times that of the first wave. So even if I assuming that the peak is not as at least one time that of uh, what happened in the second wave, India, if, if, the, if the third wave happens, the case should still be, India should still be as bad as was it was in the second wave. So that's the most important point to note that the second, third wave could be as what's the second wave, if not what's. So this is point number one. However, the only point of solace over here is that if I look, if I just do a small calculation, in total in the second wave, I think around 1.7 lakhs people or so may have lost their lives. I mean, if I just make a small estimate from what happened in the first to second wave. And from this, if I just make the numbers in terms of hospitalization, in terms of death rates, and if we assuming that we are able to bring down the death rates and the hospital, the hospitalization rate from 20% to less than 10%, say at 5%, because of better health infrastructure, then the number of deaths actually could decline dramatically and could be even below 50,000. So which is around 40,000 was our estimates, which is Con, which is in fact a little bit lower than what happened in the first wave. So the only thing to note at this point of time is that we can avert a third wave, which was as devastating as second wave, provided we continue to do our vaccination better. Because one important point which we are forgetting is that the, the number of people in children in the 12 to 18 age category is around 12 to 13 to 17 crores. So we must ensure that we uh, inoculate a large portion of those children. And secondly, our medical infrastructure, whatever we have built up right now, we should maintain it and not dismantle it as we had done last time. And so if, if we do, even if we do these two things, I think third of might come or may, it may have already come as a lot of people are saying that a lot of children was infected in Maharashtra, one of the areas, but it may not be as fatal or as destructive on economic activity as it was in the second wave. So the key is vaccination and maintaining the medical infrastructure, what we have done in the second wave.
Here's my last question, and perhaps you've answered it to a certain extent, so maybe it can be a little brief, is that what, according to you, are the policy measures that must be taken now to mitigate the damage, if possible, to the economy, specifically from the government's perspective as well as the central bank? No, I think uh, from the central bank has been doing a lot of has been doing a lot of hand holding. I think for the last two years, the central bank has been Indian central bank has been the most proactive in terms of policy making. But from the government of India's perspective, I think two things are very important. The first thing is that I think even though this year's budget had was had very bold announcements, but I think the time has now come to support the state sectors in terms of a fiscal package because two back to back pandemic I think has devastated a large part of the unorganized sector. And the second thing is that while I understand the complexities of the government revenue, I think uh, and given the fan, but the fact the important one to note is that when the economic recovery starts, we need to rationalize and the fuel prices, because until and unless fuel prices are rationalized to an extent, for example, by currently diesel prices, petrol prices, petrol price more than 100, diesel is closer to 100. So until and unless we rationalize the fuel prices, I think it will be very difficult for an economic recovery to sustain. So I expect that the fiscal policy should now play a more active role in supporting and recovery. And, uh, and, and, and the markets will take it very nice kindly even if we are able to say that we are foregoing this revenue for this year because of the simple reason is that we understand the pain which, which India has been going through and the fiscal policy endeavor is to make an uh, digression to an pre-pandemic economy in the least destructive and painful manner. Well, we can all hope that that indeed comes to pass. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, as always, a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Now, speaking about measures that are being taken on the policy front to support those sections of the economy that are most vulnerable at this juncture, the RBI governor also announced that more support would be provided to micro, small and medium enterprises as part of the credit guarantee scheme that is currently ongoing. Listen in. To nurture the still nascent growth impulses and ensure continued flow of credit to real economy, the Reserve Bank had extended fresh support of rupees 50,000 crore, 50,000 crore on 7th April to all India financial institutions for new lending in 2021-22. This included 15,000 crore to Small Industries Development Bank of India, that is SIDB, to further support the funding requirements of micro, small and medium enterprises, that is MSMEs, particularly smaller MSMEs and other businesses, including those in credit deficient and as aspirational districts. It has been decided to extend a special liquidity facility of rupees 16,000 crore to SIDBI for on lending re or refinancing through novel models and structures. Now, FMCG companies are known to have the pulse of the Indian economy, particularly its rural side. There are a lot of uh, things that can be learned from the trends that are generated, from not just the volumes that these companies generate, but also the mix of the products that they sell and the geographies that they sell to. If there is a shift in that mix, there's a lot that can be learned. Here's Vinny Motiwala with a report on how much rural India contributes to the FMCG companies in India. The second wave of COVID surely has been more widespread this time around and has hit more uh, rural areas as well as urban areas as well. So, you know, this time more smaller towns, small cities, uh, very far off villages also have been impacted by uh, the second wave of COVID-19. And that does, uh, you know, overall uh, bring in concerns about how the demand is going to be in rural India. Also, one more concern that does come out on the rural side is that the rural wages, we've seen a decline coming in on the rural wages as well. And, you know, the rural uh, wage growth for both both agriculture as well as non-agriculture activity has declined lately. So that is something as a bit of a worry over there because that means there is less income in the uh, hands of rural, uh, for rural consumers as well and that is surely a concern and a worry coming in over there. So overall yes this time around uh, 
you know, the wave has been uh, more intense as well. Even urban consumers have uh, actually tapped into the savings and used most of the savings for treating themselves. So that is also an, uh, a data point which does highlight about how, uh, you know, we could see some impact coming in on the demand. Now, specifically talking about rural, for FMCG, rural accounts to around 35 to 40 percent of their sales. And especially the FMCG rural contribution where North India accounts to 38% of rural contribution, East India is around 48%. That is the highest where in terms of rural contribution and rural population is the most. So that we have seen that, you know, North India, East India was a lot impacted this time around as well. So that also does show us a sign that, you know, could we see an impact coming in on the rural uh, front, especially for FMCG companies. Retail consumption also shows that, you know, Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, they account to higher a uh, percent of uh, retail consumption sales in the country. So that means, you know, if urban recovers faster, maybe uh, we would not see that much of an impact coming in for retail consumption because most of the consumers are from the uh, big towns and cities. So that does play a big role and we will surely keep an eye out going forward as well. You know how this actually plays out. Even now, uh, FMCG companies have highlighted that, you know, rural as of now till April, it was a strong story. But there are uncertain times ahead and, you know, they will keep a close eye on these uh, data points as well going forward on how the rural demand actually pans out. And that is what we will be keeping an eye out on as well. Now, there's no doubt that things have started to improve in terms of the total number of cases and also the spread of those cases. Over 47% of India's districts are now showing a COVID positivity rate of less than 5% as cases in almost half the country have declined over the course of this last week. That's according to the latest health ministry data. Now, one factor that could lead to a bit of a pop in economic activity in the second half of June, as well as the start of the next quarter, is that quite a few states are now considering rolling back the restrictions that have been in place since April. Uh, a number of states, in fact, uh, will start uh, easing restrictions as early as this weekend, as the 7th of June. Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Uttarakhand, Goa, Punjab, Rajasthan, uh, just to name a few, Kerala's lockdown is set to end on the 9th of June. In Maharashtra, which as you know, uh, bore the brunt of the second wave of the pandemic, uh, officials seem to be taking a more cautious approach and they've extended the lockdown till the middle of the month in all areas that have a population of more than 10 lakh. And that's quite a large swath of the state. Uh, but the state has also come up with a five-level unlock plan and even as I speak to you, the non-essential product delivery has started in the state through uh, e-commerce delivery channels and local administrations, that is district administrations, are taking calls uh, on how and when to unlock based on when the positivity rate falls below 10%. In West Bengal, where new cases are still elevated, lockdown is still uh, extended till the 15th of June. In Odisha, the lockdown has been extended till the 17th of June. Uh, already in several places, phase-wise uh, lockdown restrictions are being eased. Uh, you have uh, Uttar Pradesh that started unlocking on the 1st of June, but a curfew was set to continue in areas with uh, 600 or more active cases. In New Delhi, construction activity and factories started opening on the 31st of May itself, but other restrictions remained in force. Uh, but uh, clearly, the case rate has fallen dramatically there as well. In Madhya Pradesh, the unlock uh, began uh, in, uh, at the start of the month, uh, but the weekend lockdown is set to continue there. So the predominant view is that the agri segment of the rural economy will remain strong and resilient in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, at least more resilient than the other parts. Now, agri commodity prices have also been supportive and that has meant more money in the hands of the farmers. Here's Mubina Kapasi with a report on the latest on the commodity prices front. If there's one sector that's shown remarkable resilience during the pandemic, it's the agriculture sector. Prices and production both have been quite steady, if not in the rising mode for the most part of the last one year. Now, pricing. 
Yes, we have seen prices ebb off quite a bit, especially among the more commonly produced uh, food prices like potatoes, tomatoes, onions. In fact, they have dipped quite a bit. But look at pulses. Especially in the last few weeks, the prices of pulses from Tur to Arhar to Mung Dal have all increased quite dramatically, some of them commanding more than 100 rupees per kilo. Similarly, there are prices of wheat and rice, but here I must say they've been relatively flattish all through 2021. However, do note that a, a big chunk of the price rise on the retail front has come in because of the fact that petrol and diesel prices have risen. And taking this food from farm to fork, of course, does require the all-important commodity of petrol. So a part of the rise in retail prices also has to do with that. However, even if prices have been flattish or stable, production has more than made up for it. Ravi production last year was at a record high of more than 153 million tons. This includes produce like wheat and even mustard. And now the expectation is that Kharif crop as well is going to be bumper. In fact, the state of Maharashtra has raised the Kharif crop output estimate with increase in sowing area as well. Remember, in 2020, 2020 to 2021, the state had utilized 151 lakh hectares for Kharif crops. This despite setting a lower target and ex it expects this trend to continue from here on as well. The rural economy has in the past surprised all of us, both in terms of its capacity to, to generate economic growth and also its resilience to face troubles and tribulations. The hope now is that the vaccination drive gathers space and reaches even the far-flung corners of our large country. The hope is that India's common man and woman emerges from this pandemic stronger than ever before. Thanks so much for watching. This is ET Now. <laughs>